Okay, today we're gonna to talk about kind of how the model of the atom has evolved over time, if you will. So we talked before about kind of the rise of chemistry from alchemy. And I wanna talk about, now that we've reached atoms, this indivisible particle of matter, um, how do we go about modeling it? And then how has that changed with the discovery of the various subatomic particles? And we're just gonna get into electrons, protons, and neutrons today, the three major subatomic particles. We're not gonna get much further than that, uh, you know, down into quarks and muons and all those kinds of things. We'll just stay with protons, neutrons, and electrons. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the model of the atom. But in order to talk about models, I wanna just kinda of make the distinction between a physical model and a conceptual model. Now models in general are simplified views of reality, which means that if you're using a model, whether it's physical or conceptual, then you're not really looking at the way things 100% all the time actually work. You're looking at a way to understand the way that these things work, and it's just gonna be a simplified view of that in order to help understand um, whatever it is that you're modeling. So a physical model models physical characteristics about something. So for example, you might model a biological cell. And you guys have probably seen this before in your natural science courses, in your physical science courses. You might have a cell and there's a large cell and it's got a nucleus in it and a Golgi apparatus and uh, endoplasmic reticulum and, and it's got all these, these ribosomes and all these things in it that you can take out and you can see all of the different um, bits and pieces of the biological cell. So that's a physical model. You're physically modeling the way that something looks. A conceptual model models the behavior of a system. So an example of a conceptual model could be something like um, tide charts or weather patterns. So if you've ever looked at tide charts for the oceans, then you've seen that the tide charts show the pattern of the way that the water moves the way that the tides flow. It's not actually modeling what a tide or what the ocean looks like per se. It's modeling the behavior. How does it move? Um, and that gives you information about a lot of different things. So instead of modeling physically what something looks like characteristics wise, you're modeling its behavior. And atoms, when we're talking about models for atoms, can fall under both of these categories. They can be either physical or conceptual or in sometimes combinations of both. So in order to kind of talk about how the model of the atom has changed, we have to talk about where we started. So when we left off talking about a little bit of history, we talked about John Dalton. John Dalton was our father of modern atomic theory. And he said that everything is made up of atoms. These atoms are indivisible. It came from the term atomos, which is the Greek for indivisible or not cut. And so his model of the atom was just a particle that could not be further broken down. And this particle would be different if it was a different element. So if I had a particle of gold versus a particle of carbon, then the smallest indivisible unit would be different from each other. And the way that they would be different is by having different masses, okay? Being made up of different amounts of matter. And that was John Dalton's model. So along came a man named J.J. Thompson. And J.J. Thompson was a British scientist. And J.J. Thompson, discovered the electron. And when we're talking about electrons and we're using them in kind of diagrams and such, I usually will abbreviate them with an E to the minus sign. Okay, and we'll talk about why that is here in a second. So J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. The electron was the first subatomic particle discovered. And it was discovered through um, a couple different experiments. And I'm just gonna give you the names of them. You don't have to understand them in a lot of detail. You can find some information about them if you just Google them, or if you look in your book, um, then you can find it there too. Um, the first was the cathode ray tube experiment. And the cathode ray tube experiment, or CRT, cathode ray tubes are the energy source responsible for those gigantic televisions. So these days, you know, you have the thin televisions and they're LED and they're backlit and you have all these kinds of fanciness. Well, we used to have TVs that were gigantic and really hard to move and you wouldn't even move your apartment. You'd just throw it away, throw it off the balcony because it was just too hard to move. 
So these cathode ray tubes were the energy source in those particular televisions. And they used to study them back in the day because they produce a beam of what they appeared to be energy. And they would study this beam. And so in studying this beam in a cathode ray tube, J.J. Thompson discovered some characteristics. Um, and he was looking at the beam specifically. He didn't quite know what it was at the time, but he figured out that whatever makes up that beam within the cathode ray tube is negatively charged. So that's kind of what came out of this. So it has kind of a minus charge, a minus sign. And then he did another experiment with a guy named Milliken. It's the oil drop experiment. And in the oil drop experiment, he figured out the mass of this particle, the mass of the particle that is in these cathode rays. And he found that the mass was over a thousand times smaller than the mass of a hydrogen atom. Um, you know, even more than that. So that's a pretty significant ex discovery because the smallest known atom is a hydrogen atom. So it's number one on the periodic table and number one on the periodic table is the smallest of the known atoms. And if Dalton's idea about atoms is correct, then there could be nothing that is smaller than the smallest of the atoms. So this was revelatory and J.J. Thompson said, okay, well, I have this particle. It's negatively charged. It's smaller than a hydrogen atom. Um, we're gonna call it an electron. And that's why we symbolize it with an E to the negative sign because of its negative charge. But now he had to come up with a new model for an atom because we can't just use business as usual here. So he had, well, okay, here's the particle, or he kind of visual, visualized it or envisioned it as kind of a cloud. Um, so you can kind of see it both ways, particle, cloud. Okay, so the cloud and the particle itself um, is sort of vague in terms of what it looks like. And within this particle cloud, there would have to be these teeny tiny electrons. So there's these little particles. Here's my negatively charged particles in here. And these negatively charged particles that are embedded in this cloud, what they knew about atoms at the time is that they're neutral. So an atom itself is neutral. And if it's neutral, then I can't just have a bunch of negatively charged things in it. If this was just uh, negatively charged, then that would have an overall negative charge. So there has to be something in this particle or in this cloud that balances out that negative charge. So what J.J. Thompson said is, well, in my model of the atom, this particle or cloud has got to be positive. It's got to be a positively charged particle. So overall, this thing is positively charged. I'm just going to represent that with plus signs here, or that it's positively charged. Okay, so these positively charged particles with these negatively charged electrons in them, because he is British, this model is called the plum pudding model, where the pudding is this positively charged particle, and the plums are your negatively charged electrons, and that's J.J. Thompson's model of the atom then that accounts for these smaller particles. Sometimes you'll also see this model called the raisin bread model, and I think that's a little more of an Americanization of that, but plum pudding was the original way that they was talked about. Okay, so that's J.J. Thompson. Now, a man who worked with J.J. Thompson was a man named Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford, and I like Rutherford for a lot of reasons. We're gonna run into him in our nuclear chemistry chapter as well. Ernest Rutherford was from New Zealand, and there's not a lot of chemists from New Zealand, so Ernest Rutherford's kind of unique in that regard. And he worked with J.J. Thompson in his lab. And he did um, experiments, and he figured out what that positively charged stuff in the atom had to be, because he was the one who discovered the proton. 
And when we abbreviate proton, it's usually just a P. Sometimes you'll see it with a P to the plus sign there, the proton. And he did an experiment called the gold foil experiment. Gold foil experiment. And so he said, all right, well, if the atom looks like this, electrons are teeny, teeny, tiny. So these electrons are not taking up much space. So this is not drawn to scale here in my plum pudding model here. So what he and J.J. Thompson figured is that an atom is mostly empty space with these tiny electrons in it. So he did what's called the gold foil experiment where he took a square of gold foil and he shot at that gold foil um, some alpha particles. And an alpha particle is made up of two protons and two neutrons, each particle. It's basically a helium nucleus. It's radioactive. We'll kind of talk about it in a later portion. But here's my source of al alpha particles, whatever it may be. And he shot the alpha particles at the gold foil. Here's my AU, I got gold. So here's my gold foil. And what he s expected is if the atom was empty space mostly, then if I shoot some particles at it, then it should go straight through. Okay, that was his anticipation for what would happen. So he set up a detector around his gold foil and the detector was kind of like a photography film. So his detector is here, detector. Um, and every time the alpha particles would strike the detector, then that would let him know with a sensor and where it struck on this would be recorded because it has this kind of film quality to it. So as he anticipated and as he had theorized and hypothesized, um, many of the alpha particles came straight through and hit right here at the back. Okay, that was what he was expecting to happen from the gold foil. But to his surprise, some of them deflected off. Some of them deflected almost close to straight back. And so they were deflecting off of the foil. So there must have been something in there that was deflecting these particles. And the something in there turned out to be the nucleus of an atom. And so he not only discovered the proton, but at the same time he discovered the nucleus, which is the center of the atom. And he figured out that it contained protons. Now he was so surprised by this. Rutherford was not expecting this to happen. Sorry about that. Um, he was so surprised by this. He famously is quoted as saying that it was like, it was as if I had shot a gun at a piece of tissue paper and the bullet bounced backwards. That's how surprised he was by this experiment. He was expecting it to just go straight through and that's it. So his discovery was really important in terms of the model of the atom because now we have something that has a lot of mass at the center of our atom and counterbalances our negatively charged electrons. So it kind of solves the problem of the plum pudding model. So Rutherford's model then had to account for all of these features. And Rutherford's model, I like just calling it Rutherford's model, um, sometimes it's also called the planetary model, which can run into some confusion because there's a model later on that is also called the planetary model. But the Rutherford model is the one that we um, usually think of when we think of an atom. So there's a positively charged nucleus at the center. Uh, there's a lot of mass there. And around this nucleus, in what he kind of figured were orbits, are the electrons. And pardon my childlike drawing here. My skills of an artist are not so great. Okay, so positively charged nucleus, electrons in orbits. Hence the planetary model. So the electrons are in orbits around the center, around the nucleus, as if they were planets orbiting the sun. And, um, and that was the model. And that's one that we still kind of commonly visualize today. So now there was a balance between the negatively charged electrons, the positively charged protons, but Rutherford anticipated that there was a problem with this model 
because if we have a bunch of positively charged particles in a really small space, so we have this small massive core to an atom that he called the nucleus, then all these positive charges are gonna want to repel each other, right? Like charges want to repel. So if you have two positive things that you bring in close to each other, they are going to want to naturally get as far away from each other as possible, right? Like charges repel. So if I have a bunch of positively charged protons in a small amount of space, there has to be something else in there to keep them stuck together. There has to be something else in there that's helping to balance out those um, positive charges, um, their natural inclination to want to repel each other. And so he really, uh, with this thought, was predicting the existence of the neutron. Now he never isolated it and he never was able to discover that particular particle, but he knew that there had to be something else in there because of this problem with his model. So he was aware that this was a simplified view of reality and there were still some issues with it, but it was closer than they had before, right? So progress, scientific progress. And along came a man named James Chadwick. And James Chadwick is the one that discovered the neutron. Neutrons are often just an n or n to the zero. Uh, neutrons are neutral, so no charge. And in terms of size, a neutron and a proton are around the same size. So we'll talk about it in terms of mass then. They're made up of about the same amount of matter. Um, they have a, roughly the same weight, if you want to think about it that way. Um, so James Chadwick didn't discover the neutron until the 1930s. So kind of all of this leading up to this was all happening in the 1800s. So Rutherford and J.J. Thompson were banging around in the 1800s. Post John Dalton, John Dalton was the late 1700s, early 1800s. And now we're into James Chadwick, who in the 1930s figured out that there was this neutron in there, this neutrally charged particle. So that means that this is still relatively recent science. This is within the last 100 years. And this is kind of an interesting thing about science is we're looking back at this and saying, well, duh, you walked into the classroom in your first day and knew what an atom looked like, right? It has a nucleus, it's got protons, it's got neutrons in it, and then there's electrons that are going around it, right? You had this concept of an atom that they had uh, less of an idea about even just 100 years ago. Okay, so a lot of progress happens in a relatively short amount of time because we are sciencing, we're employing the scientific method. Okay, so these are some of the personalities involved and this kind of gets us to uh, talking about the actual physical models of the atom and in our uh, subsequent videos we'll talk a little bit more about conceptual models of atoms. So if you have any questions on this don't hesitate to ask and I'll talk to you again soon.